Good morning, and welcome to the expertly guided cloud migration webinar. My name is Simon Tracy. I'm a solution architect for Amazon Web Services, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's presentation. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either the phone call or the computer audio. If for any reason you'd like to change that during the webinar, uh, you can do so by accessing the audio pane in the control panel. Uh, from this control panel, you will also have the opportunity to submit questions during today's webinar. And I encourage any of you who have questions, please do so. And we will try and answer as many questions as possible when we get to the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. Also at the end of today's event is a brief survey. So if you could please stay connected until the end of the broadcast and submit your feedback, your opinions really do count. Lastly, the PowerPoint presentation will be available uh, through SlideShare along with a recording of the webinar on YouTube. We will be sending out emails in two to three days after the end of today's event. So I would like to say welcome once again. Uh, as I said, my name is Simon Tracy. I'm also uh, pleased to be joined by Stephen Old, who is the Public Cloud Specialist Lead at Clarinet, and also Brett King, who is Head of Service Delivery at Funky Pigeon. Uh, I will be kicking us off and talking through uh, some of the journeys you can do going through business transformation. I will then be handing over to Stephen, who will talk about expertly guided cloud migration uh, from a Clarinet perspective. And we'll be handing over to Brett, who will give you his first-hand experience of going through very dramatic change and what they've done at Funky Pigeon. So let's kick off. So there are a number of different reasons why people uh, look to go through a cloud migration. And what we've got in front of us are a whole host of reasons why different organizations I've spoken to have wanted to go on a business transformation. Now, some of these, uh, the ones that we haven't highlighted in red, uh, tend to be things that are outside of your control, things that uh, would drive you towards needing to make a decision as to what you're going to do on behalf of your business. Uh, for example, uh, if your co-location, your outsourcing contract is coming to an end or there is likely to be a change in it, it may be a driver that you need to make some decisions about what you're going to do. Uh, those that are in the red boxes are reasons that typically organizations I've worked with have wanted to move to the cloud. Um, and the most common reason that I have encountered to date is people looking to gain more business agility or development productivity gains for their organization. Um, probably second to that is organizations looking to improve their innovation uh, as well as trying to go through a digital transformation. So trying to be able to deliver new features to their customers more quickly to give them a competitive edge in the marketplace. Obviously, a number of people talk about cost reduction, and this is something that commonly comes alongside a business transformation, uh, but is not usually the primary driver that I've encountered with the organizations I've worked to to date. So before we get going, I'm going to just talk very briefly through a customer migration that both Clarinet and AWS worked on together. And that is the uh, uh, migration that Currency Cloud went through. And obviously you can see a, a fantastic quotation from Ed there that talks about the benefits he saw from working with AWS and Clarinet. And if you want to read more details, you can do so by following the link in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, Outside of the quote, what I like to focus in on is the data points that actually came out of doing this migration. And a number of these can be seen here in the stats in the bottom right hand <coughs> corner. So you can see that Currency Cloud went from being able to uh, create an environment in six weeks and managed to get that all the way down to six minutes. So being able to try and take advantage of that uh, rapid deployment innovation that I talked about earlier on to be able to bring new features to their customers, to be able to fail fast and reinvent quickly, and be able to deliver business value. They also managed to achieve a 30% cost reduction that was projected for their first year. And as I said, that is something that commonly comes along with the transformation. And if you do want to ask more about this, then you can reach out and you can ask a question of Stephen, who I'm sure will be happy to go through this in more detail. So I've talked about why you might move to the cloud, but let's just touch on very briefly some of the potential barriers. Now, any time you go through a change in life, there are always potential barriers to you, you doing that, and cloud adoption is no different. And some of these are perhaps more tangible, some of these are economic, and some of these are perhaps slightly more emotional. 
And this is where doing some of your work, and this may be business case related, some of this may be, if we look at uh, the lack of cloud expertise, maybe educational, where working with a partner like Claranet can be very useful. So they can assist you with bringing up uh, the level of expertise within your organization, as well as being able to lean on some of the AWS events and many training materials that are out there for you to be able to use free of charge. So there's a number of different things you may need to go through if your organization wants to move towards a rapid cloud adoption. So I mentioned business case as being one of the potential things you may have to do, but there may also be organizational changes and you know, uh, working with your people to bring them up to speed in terms of not only uh, training, but also thinking in a cloud first idea. So how you would deploy to the cloud and you know, not trying to lean on some of the older design practices that we may have used in the past. And this is something that we would encourage you to, to work with, whether you're working directly with AWS or with a partner to be able to go through to get an idea of the best cloud practices that suit your organization. We will touch on the six common migration strategies later on, so I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And I would encourage you to think uh, in a methodical migration uh, mindset when you're going through this about how you're going to do it, what uh, precursors need to be in place before you begin your cloud migration, um, and where you can use uh, interdependencies between different applications to try and accelerate that. So let's talk about building a business case for AWS migration. So there's a number of different things to consider here uh, outside of purely the cost of the individual components that you may be using. So there is also the, the cost of change, the change, uh, the, the cost it will take going through that migrationary process and the investment you need to make to gain those uh, uh, cost reductions that we talked about earlier on. There is also the need to consider the uh, labor productivity. So where you may have, for example, uh, DBAs currently doing an awful lot of sysadmin work. If you are going to leverage the cloud and use a service such as uh, RDS from Amazon Web Services, relational database service, the DBAs are able to focus on really adding their value as DBAs because the operating system is managed and taken care of by AWS. So there is an immediate productivity gain that needs to be factored into your business case. You also need to consider the business value. So where we were talking earlier on about being able to dramatically speed up your deployments and your ability to be able to produce an environment, you need to think about the additional value that can add to your business in being able to innovate faster and be able to get those new changes out to market much quicker than you were able to before. So I'm gonna focus just to start with on looking at this from a financial perspective. And we've talked already about looking at this from a migrationary point of view. So what you might need to do during a migration phase, but let's talk a little bit about the optimization phase. And this is the point where you will start to, you have migrated uh, your workload to AWS and you're going to start to try and really realize the benefits of using the cloud. Now, what we tend to see customers go through to start with is some basic optimization. So I've already mentioned the use potentially of RDS and it supports a number of database engines. So if you already have Oracle databases or uh, MySQL databases or a number of others, you are able to utilize RDS uh, with AWS and realize some of those benefits to your DBA team to hopefully be able to drive some more efficiencies and get more value out of them there. But we also see a number of customers go through what we call right sizing. And this is selecting the right type of instance now you're on the cloud. So you're able to do real life benchmarking now these resources are running and work out if the, re if the instances you're using are the correct ones for you, for you. We have a number of different instance families on AWS and some of these have different ratios between compute and memory and some of these are for specialist tasks. So trying to find the right type of instance so that you're utilizing it effectively. And by that I mean you're not running at 90% memory utilization and 10% CPU, you're using something which you're getting very good efficiencies out of that instance, is going to provide more of those cost savings that we talked about earlier on. It will also benefit you if you are going to take advantage of cloud features such as auto scaling to have instances that scale at an appropriate amount of time to be able to deliver enough additional resources when you need to scale. We then also talk about uh, customers being able to reinvent. This is looking at some of the additional services that are available on AWS and looking at some of the cost efficiencies you can get from those. So if you have an instance or a server running today, 
that is only used for say one process once a week, that's relatively inefficient and you're paying for a large amount of resources that you're not utilizing all the time. Now you can choose to either create an instance that would uh, deploy when you need it to do so, or if you don't know when you're going to need that functionality, you can also rely on services such as Lambda, uh, which is compute on demand from AWS and allows uh, that function to run as and when you need to, and you don't pay for any idle CPU cycle. So it's very, very cost efficient and provides a very high level of availability for a service that can be used on demand. If we look at this from a technology lens perspective, so we've talked about that purely from a financial and how we drive those cost efficiencies. Uh, what would we look at from a technology perspective? So looking at the different types of technologies and trying to think about uh, deploying our resources in different ways and using some of those higher level uh, options from AWS to drive value through the business. So there are services, and I mean, one of my favorites that came out uh, two years ago now is recognition. And this is a, uh, an image recognition service from AWS that you can utilize off the shelf and you can pass uh, images or text detection through this and you can derive meaningful data from it. And it's a service you can pick up and use straight away. You don't have to spin up any instances and you can provide different functionality back to your business that you weren't able to do so before. And this is the sort of thing we talk about from a technology lens perspective. What additional functionality are we going to be able to provide to the business uh, that we weren't able to do so or would have been cost or time prohibitive to do in the past? Now, as I mentioned, there's a number of different services that have come out in AWS, and this particular graph shows the exponential rate of additional services that have come out. And we can see that last year, over 1,400 additional services and features were launched. Now, there are a number of different ways you can keep up to date with this, and you can utilize uh, services such uh, resources such as the AWS blog. You can use a number of our videos that we have available on YouTube, and there's a number of free training materials. But also working with partners such as Clarinet can be very, very beneficial to try and assist you with keeping up to date with some of these changes and making sure that your environment is optimized and is taking advantage of the cloud as best possible. So we talked about uh, some of those cultural changes earlier on, but some of the other things you can implement within your organization to try and make sure you're taking advantage of the cloud as best possible is looking at possibly forming a cloud center of excellence or a cloud competency center. Uh, this is a group within your organization who would sit across your various technology groups and or pillars and would provide uh, best practice guidance to the organization on how you should be using the cloud, particular services that are your defaults and your recommended, and making sure that the appropriate security baselines are in place for your various teams. Now that's something that you can establish yourself or you can work with AWS or partners to try and set up to try and make sure that you have got a good level of governance and a uh, good level of resource within your organization to take advantage of the cloud. There are a number of different things you can also do to try and take advantage, but this is one that I've seen a number of organizations I've worked with firsthand set up. And they can really assist you when you start to move into this migration process. And we've talked about trying to do this from a methodical perspective, and we will talk in a minute about the different types of approaches we take for different applications. But the Cloud Center of Excellence, what it should be is the custodian of knowledge within the organization for the cloud. And this is a two-way process. One, they feed knowledge out to your various teams, and this may be your, you know, your network team, your security team, your Microsoft team, various other teams that would look after your different technology stacks. They would feed information into how you would expect some of those resources to be built and some of the services you'd use. But those teams, as they build and they innovate faster and faster, are going to develop new tools and new ways of working. And these should be fed back into your cloud center of excellence. So that knowledge could be recycled amongst the other teams and new teams you might start to build so you can gain faster and faster ways of working with the cloud. Now, I said I was going to mention about the different types of migration you go through. And this is where we look at what we call the six R's. And the six R's, is a process where you would define the workloads that you want to migrate and what you're going to do with them. So if we look at the top, we talk about a rehost, which is a lift and shift. So we're going to move something relatively as is um, for many reasons. Maybe we're not looking to use it for too long, or maybe we, the easiest thing to do is to do a very quick lift and shift and we'll innovate once this reaches the cloud. There are a number of different approaches you may take. 
And these go through replatforming, repurchasing, re-architecting where you may do that work of innovating ahead of moving to the cloud. And then there is the option potentially to retire if that's something you're not going to need anymore. Perhaps this was a server that was only used for monitoring other servers and you don't need that anymore because you're going to take advantage of CloudWatch or CloudTrail within AWS. Or perhaps you're going to retain. So this is something you're going to migrate in a couple of years because maybe you've gone through a recent investment cycle in that particular piece of technology. So I hope that's been useful to you. And what I want to do now is hand over to Stephen from Clarinet, who's going to talk to you uh, about his approach and his views on migration. So if I hand over to you now, Stephen. Thank you very much, Simon. So as Simon said, my name is Stephen Old. I work at Clarinet. I'm the public cloud specialist lead. Uh, that basically means I'm a technical overlay. So I've had some years in, in running businesses and then some years in uh, designing applications and helping people move them to the cloud. So today, what I really want to talk to you about is how we helped um, Funky Pigeon to an extent, but also how we view the, the cycle of, of cloud transformation. So initially, we see it in four relatively easy stages. So that's assessment, evaluation, migration, and operation. And then these should be continually happening. That's a really key part of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, our journey with uh, Funky Pigeon, for instance, actually started post their initial migration, but we've continually moved and migrated and changed them onto newer services as time's gone on. So starting with assessment, what does this really mean? Well, I think a lot of us will think about assessment and what we'll jump to is the technicals. So, you know, how many servers are you running? Uh, how, you know, uh, you know, what applications are running on those servers? And absolutely, this is a big part of it. And we've created our own tool and we use, uh, we partner with Cloud Health to help us understand the right sizing and the cost expectations for our customers when we do the assessment. Um, but we also get a good idea of the dependencies. So it's really important to understand what server talks to what, so that when you migrate, you actually understand what effect you're going to have. The next part is business, which Simon spoke about really, really well. And it's understanding what the, the cost of changes and through our process, which we call competitive edge, one of the things that we do is, is help customers assess what the cost of no change would be. So if you keep the servers you've got potentially in co-location, what you'd expect the new maintenance fees to be, what you'd expect your new co-location fees to be. So you really understand the true change and the true cost of change moving forward. We then will assess applications, and that's a really key part, uh, so we can then understand how we're going to put them through the 6R process and the evaluation. And one of the really important parts of this is we work on something called a business application diagram and process diagram. So we get an idea of all of the ways your customers interact with your business, what teams you have within the business, and then all of the applications that they use. That helps us understand what risk and what effect any migration of any application is going to have on your business. To do this, we have to interview and speak to key people around the business that are process owners. It might be the sales teams. It might be your support teams. And this actually really helps with another part of what Simon spoke about, is the cultural change and the cultural fit. When people feel that they've been involved in the process, they'll generally adopt the transformation far more easily. So next, we move into the six R's that we spoke about. So lift and shift, replatforming, repurchasing, refactoring, retaining, and re uh, retiring. What's interesting here is the more of these I do, the more it surprises me how much stuff there is that you can retire. Often you'll make quite significant savings because you'll have infrastructure that doesn't need to be there anymore. It can either be very easily replaced or hived up into a service Amazon have, meaning you can move away separate constituent parts, or it's just not there anymore. It just doesn't need to be there and it's never been switched off. Um, what we generally say is that if you re-host, it will cost the least to change, but it will cost the most when you run it. Um, to get the real efficiencies, you need to be moving to replatforming or refactoring, which may cost more to do the initial change, but you'll save significant money once running on Amazon Web Services. What people generally ask us in the evaluation stage is what challenges they're going to face. And one of them is getting people to accept the change. 
So if you've included them in the assessment process, that's certainly easier. Uh, if you talk through and build out cloud centers of excellence where you've got people from separate teams working together and creating this holistic view of how you should adopt cloud, you'll certainly find that a lot easier. But then you've got a second part. Once people are accepting change, suddenly they really will innovate and try to really move quickly. So you need to have governance in place to be able to manage and control the rate of innovation. So you understand what your billing is going to be. So you understand the key aims that are coming out of any given project. And that really will help you get the most out of cloud because you can end up having people really empowered to do some brilliant, brilliant things. So when thinking about these and the cloud center of excellence and your target operating model and your strategy in general, we generally suggest having four quite clear uh, influences. Security. Security should be at the beginning of everything you do, whether that's with DevSecOps or with your normal InfoSec teams. They actually are going to be crucial to your long-term success in the cloud. You've got to plan on being reliable. There's no point moving to AWS if you're not going to use the brilliant um, geographical infrastructure they've got for you, being able to work across availability zones. It should be auditable. You should be able to make your life easier because of the way you interact with your infrastructure. You should be able to go to an auditor and say, here's what I've got, here's who's accessed it, and this is why. And more importantly, it's got to be long term. As much as you can continually change, and that's absolutely key, you've got to enable yourself to be able to do that. So you've got to leave yourself the ability to take on these new technologies that come out. And as Simon said, there's so many coming out. At the moment, every Tuesday night, I spend four to five hours just doing homework on keeping up to date with what's come out of AWS so I can better inform my clients. And that's a big part of, of what I do at Clarinet. One of the real key things for us is we're a, a Kubernetes specialist as well. So we're big fans of running Kubernetes on the EC2 service, as well as on the uh, Elastic Container service which depends what you're trying to do, you get some real gains from that. And we've got a lot of experience in managing our own cloud. So what that allows us to do is really understand the migration journey, how you can take it off almost any given infrastructure and move it into AWS. And whether that's using containers, whether that's using Lambda, whether that's using classic EC2, we're very much used to those VMware or Hyper-V or you know, straight off, uh, off physical servers moving into public cloud. So the transition for us, we are a, an automation and orchestration house. So a big thing of what we do is around using infrastructure as code. And so here I've actually demonstrated that you can use similar things in your own cloud world uh, and in your AWS world if you're looking at a long-term migration path with, with hybrid included, which a lot of people are these days. So you can be using infrastructure as code to define templates to create your infrastructure, making it far easier. And this goes along with something we're big fans of, which is pets versus cattle, and being able to treat your infrastructure in a way that it is always going to be self-healing and can always be terminable. And that any change you make will be always written in code, again, making it very secure, because every time you do a new run, it goes back to what you have agreed as secure in the code. And also, it goes back to the ability to be audited very easily and be able to demonstrate what you've done and what changes you've made in the past. What this allows you to do as well is have a standardized governance model across everywhere, which we'll talk about a bit more in a moment, and have consistent approaches. And your team can develop much more easily being able to use a tool set that they can use in their more comfortable uh, on-premise estate and their long-term AWS estate as well. So actually, when you get into migration, often it's the easiest part if you've planned well. You'll spend a lot more time doing the planning there are some great tools out there from AWS already to, to help with some of the migration if you're doing a rehost. But if you're doing a replatform or a refactoring, you're going to be creating a lot of this stuff new. You get a real chance to go back to a truly secure state where you're going straight to what you consider good in the cloud. And to do this, you will initiate projects as any other. You'll build out the infrastructure so it's silently running without any data on there. You'll check that it runs as you expect. You'll then migrate the data across do a final test and cut over, and then project closure. And you'll continually be able to do this. And we call it tranche planning and having tranches of, of a state that moves across. So you understand what servers talk to what and what applications talk to what, so you can make sure that you migrate a group of services at the same time that are low risk because you're moving them together, and you can move them 
because you've understood the business impact at a time that makes sense for your business. One thing we are big advocates of is, is Agile. So whether this is um, a new concept to you, I think a lot of people are used to Prince2. It's great to see there's Prince2 Agile now. You can really get those benefits that make a massive difference, in my opinion, in a cloud transformation using lean pro um, things like Kanban, maybe using Scrum, Scrumban, which Clarinet are big fans of, and actually getting those Agile benefits, repetitive, uh, quick sprints to help you push through and migrate quickly. So finally, operate. You're going to have some applications that initially don't make sense to refactor that you're going to rehost. They are the kind of applications that are off the shelf. They don't get regular updates. It doesn't make sense to be following a DevOps fashion. That's absolutely fine. But a key thing and a key way of operating, and it's something that Clarinet offers as a service, is the ability to manage using the same tool sets, a mode one, a mode 1.5. So this is something that's potentially been replatformed, and then a true mode two fully automated system as well. And it's something you need to consider in your evaluation and in your uh, desire to, to move your business forward as to how you're going to long-term manage these applications once they sit on AWS. And finally, a little about how we talk to Brett so regularly. So me and Brett, me and Brett literally speak every week. Um, and we give them several different ways of getting in contact. There's Plant Online, which is a ticketing system. We do monthly service reports. We have quite in-depth uh, monitoring approaches. So uh, we jointly partner with New Relic. Um, we are big fans of constant communication. So as well as Slack um, and, and phones and emails, we have the engineers constantly available for Funky Pigeon to be able to speak to us, to be able to ask us questions, to be able to get the most out of that expertise. Uh, as I said, keeping up to date with AWS is an exciting challenge, but it is a challenge. And what Clownet wants to enable you to do is to really focus on your own business and being able to keep developing that and we will keep developing your knowledge of AWS as is needed through products that can be helpful to you. Another thing we do is, as we've been talking about going through this cycle continuously, we help people by having optimization days so they can keep optimizing and changing their estate and they can financially optimize it as well. One of our key services is helping people along that graph that Simon showed us earlier. So reinventing and you know optimizing to keep reducing costs. And that's a big thing that we managed to help Brett with. So. On that note, I'd like to hand over to Brett. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks for that introduction. So, um, good morning, everybody. I'm Brett King. Um, as it says, I'm Head of Service Delivery for Funky Pigeon. Um, service delivery is one of many hats um, I wear in my role at Funky. Um, but I was asked to come and present today um, because as a customer of Clarinet and AWS, we've been through the migration process. Um, and they wanted me to basically explain where we've been, where we're going, um, and some of the challenges we've based along the way, both from a technical perspective um, and a business perspective. Um, so if I start by just giving you some background as to who Funky Pigeon are, um, for those of you that don't know us, um, shame on you, you should be buying regularly from us, plug over. So who are we? So we are a market leader in the UK for online personalized cards and gifts. Um, I'm sure you all know the advert. We have around 4 million active customers who are buying from us on a regular basis. And over the last five years, we've probably achieved an average 30% growth year on year, which is fantastic for us. Um, and it's a challenge that we're continually striving after. Um, we're seeing an increased growth in mobile app use, which presents challenges um, because mobile screens are not as big as desktops. So when you're talking about photos and how customers can edit their cards and change what they're looking at, obviously, we have to be able to present that in a productive way for them. Um, we advertise on TV, um, which means we can't hide away, so we have to be present. The site has to be working, um, and that, again, generates its own challenges. Um, we're owned by WH Smith, not something everybody knows. Um, we're quite a small team based out of Bristol. Um, there's about 40 in total in the business, uh, not including our production staff. And we only have 16 of us in IT, so that's developers, UI, UX people, um, and then service delivery and production management. So a small team presents its own challenges um, and was one of the reasons we we have engaged with partners to help us support our AWS environment um, because we just don't have the resourcing in-house to do it ourselves. So 
to sort of wrap up from what Steve was saying, um, how have we engaged with clarinet? So Funky went to AWS around about seven years ago. Um, we did traditional lift and shift or rehost to use the new terminology. Um, lift and shift went fine, it worked, but we identified probably three years ago that really we need to start doing some transformation. We needed to move to that re-platform, the re-architecture, so that we could take full advantage of the cloud environment. Um, we were introduced to Clarinet by AWS probably about two, two and a half years ago um, as a partner that could help us deliver the level of transformation and change that we needed whilst ensuring that the infrastructure we currently got deployed could still be supported. So we engaged with them, brought them aboard, um, and the first thing we did with them was a full review. Um, as Steve says, we talk regularly, um, and they also at Clarinet do a full review of our technical and business goals. What are we trying to achieve? You know, what does our growth look like? What do we need to do? How, how does our site perform? What are our peaks like? This was critical to help Clarinet and us understand what we needed um, and how it all had to work. Um, from that review, we identified a hell of a lot of opportunities that we are working through. We also identified risks, you know, areas that actually, if we didn't do something about them, would cause us problems. Um, and from that, we've developed our long-term strategy. Um, we're looking at things like center of excellence for cloud, how we do that, what our new technologies need to be, and how we um, migrate stuff um, outside of just the website into AWS. Um, as Steve and Simon both alluded to, um, the rate of release from Amazon is phenomenal. Um, and I couldn't afford to spend four hours on a Tuesday night reviewing and doing homework on what's been released. So we rely heavily on Clarinet to tell us um, what's coming out and what's relevant to us based on uh, the infrastructure and services that we are running and what, how that might affect um, our long-term strategy. So I thought what I'd do now is just go through some of the challenges. So starting with the business challenges that Funky face. Um, and these are ones that are basically driven, if you like, by the management teams. Um, first one, which is not unique to anyone really, but having a secure, stable, and fast web platform. Um, this is critical. Like I said, we are an online business. Um, we're seasonal. So we need to make sure we have a platform that can deliver um, 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, at the same time, it needs to deliver that continual growth. So a 30% growth rate means that we can't just stay with a static infrastructure. It has to be able to scale and remain performant. That's critical because um, customer journey times, website performance times can affect you know, conversions. And we, we know from experience, if the site slows down, we lose sales. So it was, it's critical that whatever we do achieves those first two um, challenges. The third business challenge we've had, which is not, it's, it's a strange one, but it's multi-photos. So when this business started out 10 years ago, um, the idea of putting one photo on the front of a card um, with your name to send to somebody was fantastic. Um, everybody loved it, and that was where we were. About two, three years ago, our design teams started to improve our product ranges. And one of the things they started to do was make cards have two photos on the front. That became three, four, etc. We then started to roll that out across all of our product ranges. So our cushions, our mugs, um, our aprons, our posters. And now out of our top 10 best selling cards, eight have at least six photos on them. Um, we have some products which have 15 photos on them. Well, obviously we have to get the customer photo into the environment. Um, so it's important that this works um, and it creates extra stress, um, especially at Christmas when people are doing calendars, um, you know, a 12 page calendar with nine or 10 photos potentially on every page. It's an awful lot of files to be handling. So we had to have infrastructure that would cope with that. So as it says there in December, we took around 2 million plus customer photos to um, put onto product. Um, that's an awful lot um, and we probably double what we took in December 2015. So, as you can see, massive, massive increase in what we're doing. Um, final business challenge, again, retail, e-commerce, cost control. Don't just go and spend money unnecessarily. Make sure that what we're doing is within budget um, and isn't costing us money. Some of our technical challenges, speed of deployment. 
um, as I alluded to earlier, we're, we're a very small IT team, so we can't spend weeks and months trying to work out how to implement stuff. Um, and we can't wait. The business is ever challenging us to deliver new stuff faster. So um, that's a big, big challenge. Um, security, as Steve said, security has to be at the front of everything we do these days. Um, this landscape's ever changing. You know, the latest hack, the, the latest patch that's needed, and also governance, um, keeping our, our internal IT um, infosec teams happy, making sure that we are yeah, using the right levels of encryption, stuff like that. Um, also, big technical challenge for us, as I've probably alluded to again, flex, flexibility and scalability. We're a very seasonal business um, where we have very defined peak trading, so Christmas and Valentine's Day, stuff like that. Um, Christmas, we can see a fourfold increase in load. So we had to make sure we were on a platform that could cope with that, um, as well as coping with our normal uh, business as usual running. Um, we're constantly changing the infrastructures, um, resizing things, moving things around. So we need something that could help us do that. And the final technical challenge, which um, is key for me on a personal note, really, um, is keeping our focus on innovation, not maintenance. Whilst I grew up in the world of stroking tin and feeding and watering servers, since I've been involved within the cloud environments and AWS, not a world I want to go back to. It's also about keeping my developers um, interested in what's going on, um, not letting them fall into a rut of doing the same thing day in, day out. Um, I've got some very talented developers in the business. It's key that they are doing new stuff. Otherwise, we will start to go backwards and not keep up with our competitors. So I thought I'd go into a few of these challenges in a little bit more detail. Um, and the first big one, uh, stability, because without a stable site, um, we're not trading. Um, there were a few things that we had with this. So when we moved and did our lift and shift, um, we lifted and shifted the monolithic architecture because seven years ago, that was the way things were built. Um, and also there wasn't the depth of service in AWS back then um, that there is these days. What we were finding though was this monolithic architecture and the way it was uh, built and the use of traditional file servers and stuff like that was resulting in performance issues, especially during peak. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've seen a massive increase in photo uploads. Um, and we know at one point uh, around 2016, um, we were taking three, 400 photos a second. Um, well, traditional architected infrastructure just couldn't handle that. It didn't matter how big a box we put on it from Amazon. It didn't matter how big a hard drive, how performant the hard drive, you just reached the limitations of operating system, network, stuff like that. So we carried out a well-architected review with our Amazon um, architect and also involved Clarinet in this as well. Um, and it highlighted the areas of concern that we were going to have to address if we wanted to maintain stability during peak. Of course, one of the issues around doing that, as I said before, we had limited resource. So we couldn't do anything that would require a lot of maintenance um, or management. So how did we solve it? Well, we worked with Amazon and our partners, Clarinet in particular, to define the new architecture. Um, we ended up with S3. Um, to replace the more traditional file shares because S3 gave us that ability to just scale and not worry about volumes of files. Um, we faced many challenges during development. Um, we often joke that the web browser is a hostile environment um, because what we were finding is one thing we'd write that worked in one browser didn't then work in another browser, so you'd adjust it and then it didn't work in the first browser. Um, I'm sure it's a challenge many of you on this webinar have faced in the past. Um, but we've got that. Um, we also adopted CloudFront um, because we identified, again, while photos could be uploaded into S3, actually we wanted them to be uploaded quickly so that customers weren't spending hours waiting for their photos to arrive. Um, and then the most interesting thing, I guess, from certainly from my developer's perspective, was we identified that rather than using traditional resource on our web servers to uh, adjust and manipulate photos, we should use Lambda. Um, go serverless, self-scaling, self-maintaining, self-healing. Um, this probably was the biggest transformation because as well as actually making sure we delivered what we needed to deliver technically, it actually gave our developers a true sense of what we could achieve with a native cloud platform, um, something which they may have may necessarily have not been 100% um, confident about in the past. So what did this result in? Well, for peak, 
we've been able to reduce our web tier sizes by around about 50 percent because now they're not handling photos they can just focus on delivering the site um that resulted in a 35 percent cost saving especially during peak trading um which is fantastic so again i'm achieving my goals of keeping the site stable and reducing costs um not something i would have done in the traditional world that's for sure um no change in load so we we monitor the life out of our systems we know every transaction time down to the last millisecond um, we were able to load test and show that actually it didn't matter how many users we threw at it how many photos we threw at it the customer journey was consistent with normal which was good um, some of our transaction time dropped by a 50 percent which was fantastic we also coped with a 20 percent increase in customer images something which i'll be honest without these changes we wouldn't have done and that would have caused us uh, more problems we also had 100 percent availability which was a key target for us. Um, with, without that, like I say, we're, we're losing sales, we're losing money, um, and then we're all getting challenged, which is not a good place to be. And finally, there's no service for me to water and feed, which on a personal note is fantastic. So what's the next challenge? The next challenge is growth. Um, we're always challenged by the business, both our own management teams and also the Smith management teams to be growing the business by 20% year on year. We're doing that through the normal methods, you know, SEO, PPC, our TV campaigns, email campaigns, stuff like that. We're also increasing um, our product ranges um, as a way of trying to attract new customers. Um, so again, one of the challenges around product range is how do we deploy them quickly um, into the site and also into our production environments. Um, it's not a simple case of just going, there you go, there's a product on the site, there's a work around how it looks, how, it, how we edit it, um, and stuff like that. We're also looking at other income streams as well. So rather than just focusing on what we can do with the website, um, we were looking at if there were other opportunities um, for income. So one of the ones we did identify um, was photo printing. So obviously we're very used to handling photos now. So it seemed very sensible to actually go, go into the world of printing photos directly. Um, we know this is now a big market. We've moved away from people just taking photos on their phone and leaving them on their phone, we're seeing a massive increase in people actually wanting to print them. So we've developed an app in-house um, and we took the opportunity working with Clarinet to actually deploy the infrastructure for this fully via the Terraform systems. So completely infrastructure as code. Again, revolutionary breakthrough for us based on where we've been and what we were doing. Um, and it simplified our release process. So now my developers can write, write their code, put it into one place, I can then go and launch new servers and then new code is deployed automatically, which is fantastic. The other thing which we managed to do with this and we're now sort of doing moving forward, we've improved our tagging. So one of the key things in AWS is that we've identified is tagging our resources so that we can actually track costs accurately. So what's happened? Well, obviously, as I say, we've now got the photo printing app and uptake is increasing on a daily basis, which is fantastic. Um, I've also now been able to report the monthly costs of running that app. So obviously a new app, when it first comes out, it's not making money, you know, it takes time. But what we've been able to do is say, well, actually it's costing us X, we're making Y, therefore we're okay, we keep going. Um, and this is fantastic for, as far as the business is concerned. And finally, we've got a fully immutable infrastructure that no, requires no management. If the server dies, it just comes back exactly as it was, which is again, a really useful place to be. The next challenge I want to go through is data analysis. So this is part of our growth challenge. Um, we identified that we needed to be able to ask more of the vast pool of data that we own around our customer base um, and their orders and their order histories and their order patterns. Um, problems with that, we didn't really have a single source of truth for it. Um, we've got multiple databases in multiple places doing multiple things. Um, so we needed to be able to pull all that data together um, and be able to analyze it. But again, limited resource. I have one developer for business intelligence, um, so I couldn't make this too complicated for him. I also wanted a solution that could scale. So we'd start with small sets of data, and as we increased it, we didn't want to have to suddenly go, oh, we need to change the platform. I also, as is usual in the world of Funky, given a short time scale to achieve this. So how did we do it? Well, we ended up with Redshift after multiple conversations with both Clarinet and our solution architect at Amazon. Um, Redshift was the logical choice. Um, so we deployed a proof of concept uh, very quickly, um, took me about a day to get it up and running. We then worked with Clarinet and 10 days later we had fully automated deployment of Redshift um, with data being moved into it. As a result, 
we're now able to deploy our reports in days rather than weeks, um, which is fantastic. Um, it's made our life a lot better. Let me just go back one slide. Um, we also have a single source of truth. So we now know that this is the place we get our information from. Um, and the other big, big, big benefit we've had is we're now able to self-service data. So we're able to create data exports that people can then go off and analyze in Excel as they wish. So the final big challenge that we had was cost. Um, I, as part of my service role, um, always being challenged to reduce our running costs um, by a minimum of 10% year on year, whilst not impacting performance or stability. I'm also being asked to be able to report our running costs by app and function. Um, as we grow the business and we do more, we're looking at being able to identify cost per business section. So how have we done that? Well, we work very closely with Clarinet on their FinOps stuff. Um, and through the use of their tools, we've been able to better right size um, our instances. Um, and that's not just around CPU and memory. Um, because of the nature of what we do with photo handling, a lot of data moving around, networking was also very key to what we were doing. Um, and traditional methods of looking at right sizing don't necessarily take that into account. Um, but our conversations with the guys at Clarinet um, about this have enabled us to um, massively improve um, our instance types and sizing to give us the best bang for our buck. Um, we've also improved lifecycle policies on our data storage. Um, by doing that, we had a 30% cost reduction on our S3 storage costs in month one, um, which again, absolutely fantastic as far as I was concerned. Um, removed unused resources. So again, we were able to identify um, disks, snapshots, stuff like that that were running that actually we didn't need anymore. Um, within the first couple of months, I will be honest, Clarinet had saved us enough money to be able to pay for their services, which was great. Um, so results overall on our costs with our work with Clarinet, we've reduced our running costs by an average of 20% per month, um, which is great. And we're pushing that further down as we take more of the Amazon services. Um, reserved instance purchasing, probably the most accurate we've ever been this year. Um, and again, has, whilst we've had to spend the cash, it's saved us mo loads of money in the long term. Um, we're predicting 40% year one savings, 25% in year two, and that will carry on. And I'm also now able to provide cost reports to our internal business units so that the team that look after this know exactly how much they are spending. So what does the future hold? Um, continual adoption of relevant AWS services. Um, the more we use, the more we grow in confidence, uh, the more we like it the more we'll use, the cheaper things will become. Um, we're currently deploying our first completely serverless application. So we've managed to have a solution going in, which is pure S3, Lambda, API Gateway. There's no servers for me to worry about. We know it will just sit there and do what it needs to do and scale accordingly. Our ultimate goal, um, and we're a little way off this, but we are heading towards it, is full automation of our infrastructure and code releases. So we end up with an environment where we, we push a button, everything is released, and we don't have to worry about it. And finally, um, our confidence in AWS and confidence in Clarinet is such that we have additional workloads that we are migrating. Um, I'm working on multiple projects with Clarinet now um, around the bigger group, uh, the bigger picture stuff, um, where we're creating shared services for both ourselves and Smith. Um, and that will lead to a, a massive, great um, improvement as to where we are. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, and I shall hand back to Simon um, to deal with any questions. Thank you very much, Brett. And thank you everyone for listening. As we said, we would open up for some questions from you. Uh, so let's kick off uh, and a couple of questions through. So the first we got through, you haven't said specifically who it's for. So I think we'll probably all have a stab at it, but you've asked, while now in the cloud, what is your biggest obstacle to change? Uh, so if I hand over to Stephen to start with, we'll have your take, um, then maybe from yourself, Brett, and then I'll, I'll have a stab at that one as well. Ooh, um, I think it depends on where, where you are. If, if you've ended up re-hosting, I think you often will have some of the similar obstacles you had previously. Um, but other than that, it's, it's probably keeping up to date 
uh, and I'm making sure you, you keep secure, but you can get around that pretty quickly by putting in a really good cloud center of excellence and a good governance model and, and then just keeping you know, the, the same secure standards throughout anything you're going to do. What do you think, Brett? Yeah, I, I think I'd probably agree with you there, Steve. I mean, our, certainly our biggest challenge is being a small team. Um, we don't have that resource to um, keep looking at new stuff. So I'm relying heavily on partners, but by building that centre of excellence, we're hoping that we can actually share some of those um, skills around um, and actually overcome the resistance to change as well. Um, you know, actually going, yes, cloud is the best place to be. This is what we're doing. This is where we need to go. Okay, and to make sure that I'm not repeating anything the others have said, one of my top tips when migrating to the cloud or beginning your journey with AWS in general, um, I would actually strongly recommend people make sure they have a good tagging strategy. Uh, and it may sound obvious to people, but uh, tagging your resources when you deploy them, uh, not only is, is excellent for identifying what the resources are, uh, it will also allow you to do some of the cost reporting Brett talked about, where you can define down to exactly which cost center or department every resource belongs to, and you have fantastically accurate uh, cost reporting. You can also use tags for uh, cost optimization to make sure that you are deleting certain resources that were only ever meant to be temporary resources as well. So I would, I would strongly encourage you, and um, it often sits with a cloud center of excellence to make sure you're tagging early doors and uh, you have a very good tag tagging strategy because you can get so much value from it. I think you make a really good point there actually, Simon. I, I was doing a project recently and it, it made it very obvious that they hadn't got um, the finance team involved early and involved in the CCOE when they started looking at what they were doing. And so that changed from a often a CapEx model into an on-demand, ever-changing OpEx model. It's something that is a big change for a lot of businesses. And so you've really got to get your finance team involved early, get them understanding, make sure you remove that fear factor of that constant change within the public cloud world versus an on-premise world. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we'll move on to another question. Uh, so we've got a question here. Uh, are you using the standard AWS security model with security groups and ACLs or a custom one uh, such as SecureMonkey? Uh, so if I put that over to yourself, Brett, uh, are you able to share a little bit about your security posture? Yeah, um, it is primarily the AWS one. Um, so yeah, security groups, ACLs, stuff like that. Um, and we're, we're looking at uh, some additional stuff on that. Um, we also have a security service which we put in front of all that to help us uh, monitor and maintain if you like um, and again we're working with the guys at Clarinet around uh, improving some of that um, and improving things like WAF and stuff like that but yeah it's the it's the AWS one rather than a third party one at this point in time. And Stephen do you have anything you'd like to add? I would say that predominantly our customers are using that with with the idea of secure by design and with the, the fact that it's all soft, you know, software defined in, in your networking and your policies, you close everything off unless it's screaming that it needs to be open for the application to work. And with using infrastructure as code, every time you reset, every time you do another run, you'll be going back to that secure posture. So where you are doing infrastructure as code, I think it's, it's easy to follow the, the AWS methodologies. Okay, and I think the other thing I'll, I'll add as, as my sort of top tip for that is a service that uh, a number of our customers utilize a lot, but I do come across some customers who haven't heard of it before, uh, to guarantee your security posture or to be able to report on your security posture is the use of config rules. So defining your security posture, as Stephen said, is excellent and you know, trying to use least privilege at every single point is absolutely what I'd encourage. But to be able to report on are you achieving the security posture you've intended is where you use config rules. So you can set up a rule that will tell you and, and report back if you've got MFA enabled on your root user. Or you can come back and report if you have any unencrypted EBS volumes. EBS volumes are block storage. Um, so you can then say with confidence whether you have followed the security standards that you've set for your organization or not. So I would strongly encourage if you're not using config rules today uh, to have that to be able to report on your security governance. Okay, if we move on, I think we've got time for one last question. Okay. Uh, are you using multiple VPCs 
per application or one large VPC with subnet separation. Uh, so if we start with yourself, Brett, are you able to share some details on that? Um, yeah, so we, we are a um, single VPC per environment, which we then split down into uh, various subnets for the various applications. Um, we decided that was the easiest way to go, um, certainly seven years ago when we, we lifted and shifted, um, that was probably the only real option we had. Um, and it's certainly the model we are maintaining moving forward. Um, and it tends to work with the way the guys at Clarinet um, think. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you've got any other comments on that, Steve. I entirely agree. So we try to break out applications or workloads certainly into VPCs and spread them across the availability zones. We will actually try to also break down at the account level quite a lot as well. Um, AWS certainly in the last couple of years have made it a lot easier to network across um, across accounts and VPCs and given us some brilliant tools to allow that. So where you can reduce your blast radius, and make uh, management a lot easier, make the the granularity of, of iron permissions, et cetera, even better by breaking down things further. I think that's always going to be the best way to go. Okay, thanks, guys. And I think we could possibly just squeeze in one very last question. Uh, and that is, uh, do you have a disaster recovery plan in place? And if so, to what level? Uh, so if we start with yourself again, Brett. Uh, yes, we do have a DR plan. Um, it is. Uh, it's an ever ever evolving document, if I'm being honest. Um, uh, but it is it is right down to you know in the event of a complete loss of a region, what do we do? Where do we go? Um, it's yeah, it, it's a difficult one because um, we are single cloud, obviously. Um, but yeah, it is a it is a fairly in depth uh, document that we have. Um, but we're always like I say always evolving, always uh, moving it around and working with um, the engineers at Clarinet about how it works and how we recover it um, and how that redeploys. Um, and again, the, one of the reasons we're heading towards our full infrastructure is code, because actually it doesn't matter. We just push the button and spin up wherever we need to spin up. And Stephen? I stole my thunder there, Brett. I was about to bring that exact point up. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, you can just spin up another region. I think there's two parts of disaster recovery. It's kind of seen as, a, as an ugly word these days because you should be building everything high availability, etc. But you've still got to protect yourself against uh, data corruption uh, and just protect your data. So you've still absolutely got to have that in place. You've still got to have a way of recovering from um, you know, malicious activity and using a separate region to be able to back up your data as well and then be able to use infrastructure code to build out there relatively quickly is a very easy way that Amazon allow us to, to build out and, and to defend ourselves against a disaster. Um, and the last thing I'll add, and, and very relevant to today's topic, talking about migration and, and business cases for migration, is what I have seen from a number of customers I've worked with is where in the past they've needed to have double the amount of uh, servers they need spread across two separate on-premise data centers so they had some form of disaster recovery. When they built their business cases to move to AWS, actually what they've done, rather than looking at a, an active passive deployment, is actually look at doing an active active deployment across the AWS availability zones in their particular region. And as such, they've had quite large uh, reductions in server account where before you may have had to completely double up and then have a number of additional servers to, to manage how that uh, failure was going to work. You don't need to design that way anymore. You can deploy, uh, like I said, active active across two or three availability zones, depending on the region that you're in. And you can take advantage of that high availability that Stephen talked about that way. So there are some very good cost reductions from planning for high availability rather than perhaps such a traditional DR approach. Okay, so thank you very much for everyone uh, for attending today and thank you for your questions. It's been really interesting. Uh, any of the questions we haven't had a chance to get to, or any questions you think of afterwards, uh, we're more than happy to reach out to you. So please feel free to, to send those through. Uh, please remember, as we said earlier on, to stay connected um, to be able to fill in the survey at the end of this presentation. And uh, so thank you very much for, for joining the three of us here. And we look forward to um, supporting you in what you're looking to do and future projects, uh, hopefully, we can discuss going forward. Thank you once again. And everybody, have a fantastic day.